And we're continuing our sermon series on the book of Romans called Life's Greater Story. We're looking at the second of the latter half of Romans and how we see that God puts us in his story. And today I want to talk about the famous artist. I want to talk about Vincent Van Gogh. For a year, Van Gogh has been in a mental asylum in the south of France. At times he was allowed to go outside, but he had to be accompanied by someone from the asylum. But most of the time he was just quarantined in his room, not able to go outside. He was confined to the building and he painted just things that he could see inside of his room and outside of his little window. You see, Van Gogh was a disturbed individual, not only because he was confined to his room, but also he was, ha he was confined inside of his mind. You see, he suffered lots of seizures and mental distress. In fact, what's, what I think is kind of interesting is that Van, many of Van Gogh's most famous paintings and many of his paint, paintings that you would recognize were painted during this time in his life. In his sufferings, Van Gogh ended up receiving a letter from his brother named Theo. And it was just a short letter, and, but one of the things that was included in the letter brought life and hope into Van Gogh's life. Because see, his brother included a small sketching that was done by Rembrandt. And in the sketching, it's Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And when you look at the painting or the sketching, it's very interesting. Like Jesus is standing all powerful kind of in the, in the front there. And then your eyes go down to kind of this very lit up area. And you can see Mary and Martha standing amazed, looking at the miracle that is their brother Lazarus being raised from the dead. And what, what I think is interesting is that when you look there, it, it's, they're looking almost everywhere else except up at Jesus. Like, it's a very interesting perspective on it where they're just so focused on the miracle. You know, they're, they're looking for life. They're looking for resurrection. They're needing it over there and they're looking at the miracle now, not so much at the miracle worker. And I think that pertains to us a lot, especially in our times today. You know, in our despair, in our life, we like to look at everywhere else except of the author of life, the creator of life, the redeemer of life, the, you know, the, the sustainer of life. Like we look everywhere, but for him, we'll even look at the miracles and the good things he gives us more than we look at the, the creator, right? And to be honest, sometimes it's hard to see Jesus, right? That it doesn't look like he's so much in the picture that he's fleeting much like the wind, you know, around us, you know, and it's almost like we're like those figures and those characters in Rembrandt's sketching where we're looking everywhere but seeing him, right? Because I think we're all just like Van Gogh and those people, we're all looking for life. So where is it that you usually look for life? I know, especially during now, the times are tough. Right now, I look at what I can do for life. What I can do. And, and Paul says that that's called looking to the law to find life. That we look for the law, look at what we can do, what I can done, uh, what I can make with my own hands, how I can save myself, pull myself up by the bootstraps, right? You know, many times in looking for our saves, we're looking for structure and teaching and wisdom on how we can save ourselves rather than looking at the creator, sustainer, and redeemer of all life. That's what people in Paul's day were doing, and that's what he's talking about in this chapter today that we're, that we're going to be looking at, chapter 7 of Romans. You know, they were finding purpose in their lives by doing what God wanted them to do. But the thing is, is that really where we find purpose in our, with ourselves? By just doing the things that God wants us to do? Is that the best place to find purpose in life? Or do we find it somewhere else? Let's look at that. So today we're really looking at Romans chapter seven, at least the first half 
of Romans chapter 7. Next week is the next half, by the way. And, and a lot of people, I think, um, are, are looking for the law to find life. Um, they're looking to, for what they can do, how they can be, what, what, you know, all that, some kind of checklist to go off in order to find law. law. And, and I understand that. Like, there have been huge, vast times in my own life where I really saw my self-gratification, my I saw salvation was in how I act and, and, and what I do. I think a title we have for this, and just one of them, is, is called moralism, where we look at our morals and that's what's actually going to save us. And what, what I think, and this is a kind of a joke, I don't know if anyone's going to get it, but I think I think some, you know, as Christians, the default stance is that we believe that Jesus saves us, right? Like, Jesus is the one that saves us, right? And uh, it kind of makes me laugh when I think about, like, well, what what, what do other people, like, what do we call, what, what are we calling Jesus? You know, like, are, are we like, yeah, Jesus saves us, and I call my my uh, my my gifts that I give to other people, Jesus, or I'm giving my set of beliefs I'm calling Jesus, right? Yeah, so Jesus saves us, but deep down it's actually what we are doing. We're just calling that thing Jesus. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it's. Uh, I think that some, sometimes that's the case because we live uh, in this Christian life that we know that Jesus saves us, but that's not always what we communicate with our with our actions that we'll, we'll say that by grace you've been saved through faith and that my sin separates us from God. But, you know, as soon as someone in our midst does something that we disapprove of, we quickly find out that to be part of us, to be part of this Christian group, you need to be good in this way. And that by our actions, sometimes it reveals maybe that uh, Jesus doesn't forgive every sin. And maybe we don't actually believe that Jesus actually saves everybody. And, and so I think that causes fear in us because we have all these institutions like the church and our own families and all, all of this where we have to act in accordance and be good. You know, like that's and it seems like I, and I don't think I was ever explicitly told this by anyone in the church. It's just something you kind of naturally just pick up on. But. You know, I look back at my own life and I, and I really viewed that way. And I can, I can tell that I viewed in that moralistic path and that you're saved by what you're doing, that you're meeting the checklist and all that, by how I treated other people that weren't doing things the way I thought they ought to be doing them. Like, and I look back now and I'm like, man, I'm so sad for myself and how I did that. That I, at least in my heart, I, you know, I was probably too scared, too much of a wimp to actually do anything um, bad to anybody, you know. But um, but the fact in my heart that, that I knew that they were terrible and all that stuff, like, that's that's not good. And and I think we end up living with this, this proverb of do this and you will live. So believe this, do these things, do all of this, and you will live. And, and many times we, we are looking for the law because that's where we find satisfaction. That many of us, we look and say, all right, these are the rules that I know that I can comply to, and I can do, at least I can do these and I can be saved. I can be fine, right? But when we're doing that, we're, we're, we're looking for life in the law, right? We're not looking for life in the in the death and resurrection of, of Jesus. And in that is where we actually find true life. You know, I think we're always looking for the law to find life for ourselves. But the truth is that's the only thing that Jesus brings us. And and I think that's what Jesus, that's what Jesus, that's what Paul is kind of getting at here in Romans 7. Because um, he's talking about all these people in Romans that are struggling with the same thing. Because I think he's hitting on, and why Romans is such a big important book, or big letter, right? Is that these people in Rome are struggling with the same things that we struggle with. 
And so, and so Paul says this, and, and I mean, when I was in college, I read through Romans and it changed me. I realized that I was leaning and looking for life in the law. That's, that's not what I was saying back then. I was in college, you know, but that's how I'm saying it now. I was looking for life in the law. And um, I'm wondering if it was Romans 7 that I look back now that really caused it to click inside of me. So let me read this for you. It's Romans 7, chapter 5. For while we are living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. That's an interesting statement that he's saying. Let me, let me hit that again. Like, so while we're in our sinful passions, while we're in our negativeness, our incompleteness, our, our struggle, our, our pain, and all, you know, all those things, you know, and we looked to the law and we're like, Ooh, yeah, that's the law. We're aroused by the law, right? That, that's it. Like he, he then says, when we, when we're in that and looking to the law and going, Ooh, yeah, that's, that's stuff. We're, we are at work in our members to bear the fruit of death. He says that when we're looking to the law and going, yeah, that's the ticket. When we're looking at the checklist we can do and all that, we're say, he's saying that, that we're actually causing death. And if you're honest with yourself, you can see that all around. I saw the death in how I treated people, at least in my own heart. How I thought that they were lesser than me, beneath me, not, not part of, of how good I was, you know, not actual real Christians, which really makes me laugh. Do this and you'll live. We love this. We love to go back to the law, but the law just leads to death. And for those of you that have been Christians for a while, you're, you're listening to me and you're like, yeah, but that's what Jesus said, right? That's what he said. He, he said, do this and you will live. And, and it's true. That is what Jesus said, but we can't just cherry pick Jesus sayings out of thin air and expect them to work all the time. We have to look at the context for how that phrase was said. And so it was when Jesus was being rather cagey and coy and uh, baiting isn't the right word, but kind of is some Pharisees and religious f officials of the day. Because see, this one came up to him and started asking all these questions, you know, trying to trap him and all that stuff. And so, um, so that story that when Jesus says, do this and you will live, it's actually what leads us up to the story about the good Samaritan, right? Where basically the good Samaritan is about how the wrong person is the hero of the story. So that's, that's kind of what that's about. So let's, let's actually look at this. This is from Luke chapter 10, beginning with the 26th verse. So, uh, and Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the great Shema. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 4, I believe. And, and, and Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Right? We, he says it right there, right? Do this and, and you will live. It's right there. But come on. Like, and this, this religious official, like this person talking to Jesus, they would have been fine if they had just stopped right there. They like just hadn't gone forward, but that answer wasn't good enough because the guy needed to quantify it. Because if you don't quantify who the neighbor is, shoot, that could be anybody. It could be Dale down the street who mows his lawn at four o'clock in the morning. You know, like it could, it could be anybody. Like that's, it, 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 you may have to love everybody. Like, oh my goodness, we can't do that. We gotta be able to quantify it. And Luke actually gives us a cue into what this guy does. Listen, it looks at verse 29. It says, but he, desiring to justify himself, put limits on what he has to love and what he doesn't have to, right? Said to Jesus, hey Jesus, who is my neighbor? Oh, see, that's, that's where it is. Like, and right there you see what's going on. Like, he's not, he's not in there for any kind of way that he can receive righteousness or, or anything like that. He's not looking to Jesus for any manner of wisdom. He just wants to see what he 
can do how he's just working the check boxes to make sure he's done enough to be on the good side of God and not on the bad side of God, right? And he's, he, he's like, yeah, so what is this, which part of the love of the neighbors do I need to do? It's not those sinners over there, is it? You know, it's not those over there. You know, he, this guy, it's plainly obvious. He's looking for salvation in the law. He's looking for salvation in what he can do, right? Uh, that's, that's what he is doing. And Jesus continues. He continues, right? And we know the story about the Good Samaritan, right? He, he's, the guy was, was wanting to limit who he could love, so Jesus picked out the one person that would be unlovable to that, per, that, that, that religious official, and that's the Samaritans. Those dirty, nasty Samaritans, right? And the Samaritan ends up being the one that shows mercy and shows love to, the, to this stranger. And he's asking him who, sh who was the neighbor in that story, and it was the Samaritan. And he says, go and do likewise. Be the neighbor. Do this and you'll live. And Mr. Pharisee is like, what, what? I, that's impossible. We can't love everybody. We can't love them all there. It's impossible. Yeah, and it's the same thing that's going on with the story about the rich young ruler. If we just fast forward in Luke a little bit, all the way to chapter 18, you see this rich young guy comes in up to Jesus and he asks him a great question. He goes, teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Like, so think about what's going on. We have this Pharisee, this religious leader who isn't actually wanting any wisdom from Jesus. He's just trying to trap Jesus or do something like that, you know? And, and, and then we have this other side where this guy who's obviously been blessed by God, has incredible wealth, has come up and he's asked this great question about what can he do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, knowing his heart and knowing that the guy, he's just looking, even though he's a honestly asking for Jesus, Jesus knows that there's something that's holding him back. And so he lays down the full grunt of it. And he says, you've got to become like, like the poor around you. And I imagine the guy wasn't a big fan of the poor, right? He wasn't a big fan of the poor. So, so Jesus looks at him in the eyes and he goes, you have to become like the poor around you. You have to give up everything, give it to them and live like them. And the, and the disciples are like, what? Because the guy, he, he goes, oh, I can't do that. And he just walks away dejected. You know, he just walks away with his tail between his legs, right? And, and the disciples are like, what? Like, that, that guy was the best of us. He was righteous. He was obviously blessed by God with all of this wealth. And he's asking the right questions. He's doing the right things. And they said, if that, if that guy can't do it, we understand with those religious hypocrites and all that stuff, we get it. But that guy, he was one of us, Jesus. We could ride on his coattails into glory. And like, it's, and the disciples realize what's going on. They go, it's impossible. If that guy can't get in, then there's no hope for any of us. And Jesus is like, that's right. And he says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Basically what Jesus says, it's not about following the law and finding your purpose there. You will never find life there. It's about Jesus doing the impossible in your life. And I think this is what Paul is talking about in our chapter of Romans today, chapter seven. And we have the sixth verse here that says this, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in a new way, the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We are released from the law. Jesus has done the impossible for us. The law says you have to do this, you have to do that. Do this and live, right? <laughs> but that's impossible. We can't do this and live. 
But what Paul says is that we can't do it. That the law actually just leads us to death and destruction and an empty road. But Jesus, as he makes us part of God's greater story, says that you were once dead, but now you are alive. He's done the impossible for your life. And that's what it means to be part of God's greater story. So live. Live in God's greater story. Live knowing that he has all of this for you. Knowing that you are released from the law. That you are freed to a new life. That you are part of the impossible story of God and what he does. How he has taken you from the empty, desolate, roads of destruction and brought you to new life. It's a great story. And Van Gogh, when he was stuck in his depression and despair, saw this. Because when his brother came in and gave him that painting of, of Rembrandt raising Lazarus from the dead, he saw the power of Jesus in there. He saw everyone, I'm sure he saw everyone looking away, not looking at Jesus, looking at the miracle of what is going on. And, and, but he saw that Jesus was in the background, reigning supreme. And this is why we're talking about this in Van Gogh, even though there's like a Rembrandt painting on here. Van Gogh made his own version of this painting. And you might say, as you're looking at it, you're like, wait a second. Like, Jesus isn't even there. But in the painting, you see Mary and Martha removing the tomb cloth from Lazarus' face, rejoicing. But here's why we're talking about it. When you look at the face, whose face is in there? Who is Lazarus in this painting. That's Van Gogh's face. And he painted himself into that story. And he didn't tell the story about what he did. He didn't make himself Jesus and kind of like, he's like, you're going to raise yourself up, Van Gogh. Like, yeah, he didn't make himself Jesus. He didn't make himself Mary or Martha and all this preparing and work they were going to have to do. No, he made himself the one that was stuck inside in an asylum. He made himself self into the one that Jesus rose from the dead. That he was the dead and now he is alive. And he saw Jesus had freed him from all of those expectations to clean up everything and get out of that asylum and get, get out on the loan. That Jesus had freed him from the law. And that Jesus was taking him from death to life. So in your despair, that's what Jesus does for you. So look to him. Even as we're all stuck in our homes and waiting to burst out and come out and maybe scared of what's on the outside or you're ready to come out at any time and all those things, Jesus is still right there bringing you back into his story. And he's not just on the peripheral of your, of your life, but he is bringing you from death to life. Bringing you from hopelessness to hope. Bringing life to you. He's done the impossible in your life. And I think that is good news.